Hello and welcome to another episode of ORF US Dispatch. In this episode, we discuss the stakes for India in the upcoming US presidential elections. So, uh, so in context of recent tensions in the Galwan Valley between India and China, US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo termed China's actions as "quote unquote" incredibly aggressive. Mm-hmm. Defense Secretary Mark Esper and Raksha Mandri Rajnath Singh have been in touch. I believe they've spoken twice over the past one month. Modi and Trump themselves have had a phone call. Uh, many in the many in the West have come to view these recent tensions between India and China as that um, opportunity wherein finally India would go into the American corner uh, in the in the larger scheme of things. Uh, but India has not made a pronounced indication that that's going to happen. Many analysts believe that's not happened yet because India wouldn't want its ongoing negotiations and discussions with the Chinese to take the tensions down a notch. Uh, to be complicated by its relations with the U.S., but on a on a general note, um, in the long term, um, how much do you think is America's crisis with credibility an issue in India's decision? Over the past three years, we have seen how Trump has treated America's traditional allies and partners. Trade seems to be a priority. Um, so, is is that is that a concern for India? You know, I don't think it's too much of a concern. I think the two governments have worked out uh, an understanding. I mean, it's an it's an ongoing negotiation, motivated by by their own uh, both countries' concerns and priorities. Um, uh, you know, I, uh, on the one hand, I think it's been quite clear that the U.S. is not interested in extending to India a kind of alliance relationship that it has and historically has had with its NATO allies or Japan or South Korea. And indeed, it's in the process uh, under Trump of, in some ways, opening up, rene- renegotiating those relationships with Germany, with Japan, with South Korea. Um, and in fact, there is a stronger consensus around this. It's not just Trump, although Trump has brought a, a new focus and, and his manner has made it much more blunt. But there were there were discussions even under the Obama administration of getting Europeans in particular to, to uh, raise their c- commitment and, and increase their role. So I think it's quite clear on the, on the American side that they're not interested in extending that kind of relationship to India or anyone else at this, mat- at this time. And on India's part, I think there's also clarity that um, this is something with China that is, if, if it can be to, to the extent possible, uh, dealt with bilaterally, it, uh, that is helpful. It will it'll be good for India's own credibility to try and deal with its differences with China uh, bilaterally, although ex- external support is, uh, in some ways, might be helpful. Uh, and in that sense, I think the public pronouncements by Mike Pompeo and other have been uh, help- helpful and welcomed. Uh, we don't know the extent uh, because there isn't anything in the public domain. We don't really know what level of cooperation is um, uh, being extended on a sort of day-to-day, uh, say, on intelligence gathering. Although p- past crises, uh, including Doklam, uh, we now know there, there was considerably more cooperation between the U.S. and India uh, than we knew at the time. So, uh, again, we can at this point in time, we can only speculate what kind of relationship uh, is, is underway. Uh, finally, I think that the steps, some of the steps that India has taken in retaliation, whether it is the banning of Chinese-based apps uh, or whether it is uh, the new rules for public procurement, which, which are more restrictive towards Chinese companies, will actually um, uh, in some ways mean that India will partner with other, uh, if not the United States, but U- certainly U.S. allies on uh, some of its technology and public procurement uh, going forward. Uh, so uh, in some ways, the beneficiaries of, of the Chinese app ban will be uh, U.S. and European and Korean and Japanese companies, amongst others. So um, uh, I, I think if you look at all of this together, I wouldn't be as uh, skeptical about uh, this idea that you know India has not moved into the camp. I don't think uh, we will have that kind of alliance relationship with the U.S. that um, some have certainly advocated for. But we, I think this has uh, the the clash in in the Galwan Valley has helped drive the U.S. and India closer together. Right, and to be fair to Trump, um, he has borne much continuity when it comes to U.S. India ties. So apart from the evident bonhomie between the two leaders. Um, U.S.-India ties under Trump has witnessed a considerable degree of institutionalization. So whether it's the 2 plus 2 dialogue, the establishment of hotlines between the national security advisors, signing of the defense interoperability agreement, COMCASA, signing of the industrial security annex for actualizing uh, defense co-production and co-development, strategic energy partnership, and even an all um, tri-service military exercise, Tiger Triumph. 
So it seems as if India is an exception to Trump's conduct of the America First foreign policy mm-hmm. in many ways, right? Uh, but at times, the America First impulse has taken precedence. So, and a recent example of which is, of course, Trump's executive order to temporarily halt H-1B visas to the end of this year. Uh, as we know, 70, 70% of all 85,000 H-1B visas go to Indians. Um, how do you think this will affect the bilateral tri- tie, especially at a pivotal juncture like this one? So, you know, I think on the strategic side, the, the understanding has been basically that, uh, you know, the Trump administration has wanted countries to, to burden share. Uh, and in India's case, they found a partner that is willing to burden share and not be a bird, further burden for, for India. And so I think in that sense, that partly explains in some ways why we've seen that continuity. But you're right that it's come up against, uh, in some ways, certain tensions in the bilateral relationship uh, on trade, investment, immigration, and, and other things. And H-1B, I think the H-1B visas has been the most, uh, uh, in some ways, the most consequential step that Trump has taken this year. Uh, that has uh, sort of set back uh, the relationship with India uh, for, for the reasons you've outlined. Now, uh, there has been widespread dissatisfaction in, on, about the H-1B program uh, in uh, the sort of corridors of power in, in, in the United States, and it's gone again across party lines. Uh, Trump and some of his advisors, such as Stephen Miller and others, have taken a much more aggressive view uh, on it. But they, they, on the left as well, uh, there were many members of Congress who have been advocating for reforming the H-1B system. They believe that it has uh, strayed from its original purpose uh, and that uh, it is not being always used uh, correctly by Indian companies who have argued that, that they actually do need it. And they've made a case that they have trouble finding the appropriately skilled labor in the United States to fulfill some of these jobs. So the, the suspension obviously is, is not good news, uh, either for some of the Indian companies that depend upon it or for that matter, for a lot of Indians who, who, who would be beneficiaries of it. Um, now, the question, I think, is what happens uh, going forward. Uh, uh, and a lot of it will hinge on the outcome of the presidential election in November, uh, as well as uh, what happens in Congress, because any lasting legislation that will require congressional approval as well uh, or when it comes to immigration reform. But a general sense is that it, if, if uh, this entire scheme, along with other similar schemes, will be replaced by some kind of point-based immigration system, which is actually what other countries, a lot of other countries use, uh, including Australia has recently moved to that as well. Um, and, uh, you know, the, in some of the drafts that have been circulated uh, in terms of what uh, criteria they will look for, they will look for people with higher skill degrees, particularly STEM degrees. They'll look for people with English language skills, um, and, and, and other qualifiers, which mean that you know, any system that replaces the current status quo immigration uh, system in the United States will also largely benefit uh, Indians as well. Uh, but I think in this, inter- you know, this, this intervening period between now and then, before there is any, any uh, significant immigration reform, that will actually uh, uh, be a, a, this transition period will be quite difficult for a lot of people and for a lot of Indian companies. Right. And it seems that the order was geared towards catering to Trump's 2016 campaign promise. So we all know Steve Bannon was uh, Trump's uh, chief uh, strategist, and he was instrumental in pushing Trump to make an issue uh, not only out of illegal immigration, but legal immigration as well. Mm -hmm. And H-1B was a big part of that. Um, And now it's it's evident with Trump touting his his action on H-1B to being a measure that will free up 525,000 jobs. That hardly offsets the 22 million plus jobs that have been lost because of the coronavirus pandemic, but it seems as if it's a populist measure, right? Um, So would you agree that a lot of this is just plain simple election year politics? Uh, quite a lot of it is, um, and you're right that the logic, uh, you know, if you if you look at it that way, it, it doesn't quite break down. There's a fascinating conversation uh, between uh, Bannon and Trump. Uh, this was before Trump was elected president. It was on Bannon's uh, radio show, where they spoke about uh, this program. And in fact, well, what's interesting about it is there was a difference of opinion about them, where Trump said uh, that these people are creating jobs, uh, the the high, highly skilled immigrants, and that's a good thing. And Bannon pushes back and says, uh, you know, but a country is more than an economy. It, it's a, it, there's a cultural element. And uh, it, it was interesting. I mean, it's quite revealing uh, the, the sort of difference of views there where, you know, one was Trump himself was stressing the economic benefits 
uh, whereas Bannon was was focusing on the the, the perceived cultural uh, imbalance. So uh, I think there is a lot of posturing around that. In fact, the F1 uh, visa, uh, you know, there the, the were there was an executive order that was uh, subsequently uh, recanted. Uh, when it came uh, about um, uh, students uh, on F1 visas who were taking online only courses, not being uh, having to leave the country. Uh, but I think a lot of these are, are very much populist measures uh, intended on uh, attacking uh, perceived bases of support for, uh, for, for, uh, for Trump's opponents, but also galvanizing uh, Trump's uh, support base as well. Okay, uh, moving to Biden. So his campaign recently released their agenda for the Muslim American community. Um, and the same included definitive denouncements of internment of a million Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang, the mass extermination of Rohingya Muslims. Interestingly, reference to the situation in Kashmir following the application of Article 370 was clubbed um, with these events of, of China and Myanmar. Now, I have come to read this as something uh, that the Biden campaign is sort of ceding ground on its promise of a restorationist foreign policy in its political bargain with the progressives because they've had their currency rise in the Democratic Party, notably in the, in the 2016 elections when certain Sanders supporters were disgruntled with Hillary Clinton's nomination. About 10 to 12 percent of Bernie supporters under the Bernie or Bust movement voted for Trump instead. And now there seems to be another such movement with the Never Biden movement. So the Biden campaign has been coaxed to sort of assimilate the progressives and, and create a unified platform wherein Biden is expected to make certain concessions on his stance. Mm -hmm. um, and foreign policy is increasingly being seen as, as one of that realm uh, where, where easy concessions can be made because on domestic contentious issues like Medicare for all, Biden does not have that much room for maneuver, right? Um, so do you think it was just about this, this, this political bargain with progressives? How do you read this? I think if you look at the context in which uh, the statement was made, it was obviously meant to appeal to a certain demographic base, uh, which is now an increasingly powerful demographic base uh, in, um, in the United States. Um, I think we, if you can look, even Bernie Sanders' comments on Kashmir, which were critical on the campaign trail, were done in, in a similar context, which was uh, in it was uh, to uh, donors um, and 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 certainly in, in, in to sort of appeal to a certain to cater to certain constituencies. So so I think uh, I, I would just simply look at it that way. Um, by contrast, if you look at the draft uh, Democratic Party platform, there is a mention, a very brief mention of India, which um, talks about deepening the the partnership and India being a a valuable partner. So, uh, you know, I think you'll have these competing uh, pressures. Um, I think it's quite natural in an election season uh, where the, you know, from a national security and strategic point of view, uh, India will remain a, a, an important partner. And, and you know, I think the, the democratic national security establishment sees it as such. Uh, and yet at, at the same time, I think there are these uh, concerns driven both by, uh, uh, by a sort of human rights constituency um, which, uh, you know, I think has been fair in, in sort of criticizing everybody across the board, including the United States on its own policies, um, as, as well as uh, it, it appealing to certain demographics as well, uh, who have become more uh, vocal and, and more powerful over the years. So, uh, so I think that, that largely explains uh, what we saw, but I, I would look at it purely in that context. Okay, to sort of tie it all up for our viewers. Um, so... If Trump wins, it's clear that a certain sense of continuity on strategic issues may continue. But given his, his, his focus on getting renewed trading arrangements, trade tensions might rise with, with India because negotiations have gone into, um, have gone over two, two and a half years now. And in the second term, Trump may be more frustrated about it. Whereas if Biden wins, uh, the crumbling of US bipartisanship on India is a real concern. So over the past one year, we've seen the progressive um, uh, members of the Democratic Party take up human rights issues more strongly in opposition to Trump's America first conduct of his foreign policy. Um, so is that, is that, would that be the right way to distill it as, as to how um, options for India will play out post-November? Or do you think with Biden, can you expect a more return to the past approach to U.S. foreign policy and more specifically U.S.-India ties? Uh, you know, I, th I think on, on broader foreign policy, I think, again, there'll be a tension. There'll be some who will want, uh, you know, there'll be a push for a more, for lack of a better word, centrist, uh, uh, more hawkish policy, particularly vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, and we're already seeing hints of that in the, demo I mean, uh, 
in the Democratic Party, the, the, again, the Democratic Party draft platform uh, focuses very much on China. Uh, a lot of Biden's advisors have, have focused their remarks and, and writings in the last few weeks and months on, on, China, on the China challenge. Um, there, will, there will be differences into how to approach uh, that. You know, we may see a resurrection of trade and other tools like TPP to, to try and uh, deal with, with, uh, with China. But I think there, there'll be, uh, uh, on the national security side, a very uh, strong focus uh, on that. And India has a role to play uh, you know, in, the, in the broader, in, as a partner, uh, which, which has very similar concerns about uh, China's rise in assertiveness. So, so I think that uh, there will be that impulse. At the same time, I think there will be, you know, uh, obviously more vocal um, um, criticism of certain domestic policies in India. Um, I think that that's natural. We saw a little you know, hints of that even with Barack Obama towards the end of his presidency, when he, even when he came to India on a very successful visit, the speech that he gave at Surrey Fort Auditor Auditorium, the theme largely about was plural, the, the, the benefits of pluralism and, and so forth. So, uh, um, I, you know, I, I do think we will see a slight uptick in that, but I, I would... Uh, Caution against the the sort of very doomsday approach is the, that that uh, suddenly the India relationship will be in tatters and 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 there will, there will be an attempt to wind back a lot of uh, the Trump administration's policies. I think if anything they will they will deepen, although with with perhaps with more caveats than than in the past or with some vocal more vocal criticism of certain Indian policies. Um, but I think that there is a much stronger bipartisan consensus today on on the value of the India relationship than there was even 10, 15 years ago. Um, so I, w I don't think it would be as uh, negative. One, one thing I think uh, I would caution against is we, uh, I'm not sure how many, some, sometimes some of uh, Trump's senior advisors, based on their interviews and what they've said and written uh, recently, haven't fully internalized some of the changes to the global landscape over the last four years. And so we may see a more traditionalist approach to some degree on China. Uh, that is, there, there may be attempts at trying to re-engage China in certain ways, and that will dilute the value of the India relationship. We may also see a certain traditionalism creep back into South Asia policy, specifically uh, between India and Pakistan, uh, which we have not seen much of in the last few years. So I think we will see some, you know, we, we may see some attempts, particularly in the first year of a Biden administration, if you, if you were to win, uh, of a certain creeping traditionalism in, in some of these ways before I think the realities of, of some of the changes in the region uh, uh, sort of are fully internalized within a new administration. Okay, you mentioned something very interesting with respect to China. So if the pendulum swings back to a more traditional approach to China, um, you said that US-India ties could take a hit. Uh, so does that mean that US-India India ties still continue to be pegged on the, the common strategic threat towards China? Or do you think US-India ties have now become, um, have progressed to a point where they can be independent of such third party considerations? I don't think it's yet at that stage where it's completely independent of third party considerations. Obviously, the value of the bilateral relationship, I think, between the diaspora trade and, and, and you know, other issues, I think that, that value has certainly gone up. Uh, but it's still largely seen, you know, previously through a Pakistan prism and a nuclear prism, now increasingly through a China and Indo-Pacific prism. Um, but uh, I, I do think there will be, a, you know, and, and we saw hints of this, by the way, in 2009 after Obama's uh, first uh, election where there was this attempt in 2009, 2010 to, to reach out and engage with China. And, you know, issues with India were put on the back burner. Uh, the, the rebalance or so pivot to Asia was in some way in 2011 was an attempt to, to try and, and uh, sort of redress that. But, uh, but I do think it, it still very much hinges on, on third party relationships. All right. Uh, that's all for this episode. Until next time, take care and stay safe.